what connects us to the past and also makes us part of the Marxist, a particular part of the Marxist tradition and the valuable part of the Marxist tradition, I think, is what we carried. That would be, I think, my answer. Socialism from below, get rid of the muck of ages. I don't know. That, that, that's, that's where I think it lies. And what was, what distinguished it from the previous traditions that it obviously based itself on, but was very different from? Well, it came out of Trotskyism. And, um, the eyes came out of Trotskyism. And Trotsky himself was in some ways a wonderful... I mean, if you read something like The History of the Russian Revolution, he is a fantastic exponent of the idea of popular power. Um, I, I could go and dig out passages that I could read to you um, illustrating that. But when it came to theorising, the Stalinist state, he lost sight of that, I think. And it was the great merit of Tony Cliff that he recovered that. Um, which meant breaking with Trotsky's theory of the degenerated worker state and insisting it had nothing to do with the worker state, it was state capitalism. Um, I mean, the, 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 the particular notion that it was state capitalism was particular to Cliff. There was a, a wider tradition, I mean, there were people who took the position that it was bureaucratic collectivism who also belonged to, the, I think, to that same tradition of emancipation from below. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but some of them did. Mm -hmm. um, Cliff, I think, gave a better explanation of, 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 of Stalinism than they did. But they, with the best of them, he shared that impulse towards uh, working class self-emancipation as being the core of the Marxist idea, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> so I'll probably change my mind tomorrow. <laughs> So my uh, question is, is going to be a little irreverent in the sense that it was essentially, you know, less than 50 people who wanted to intervene in the British working class. How does that work? Well, it, it required a certain chutzpah, um, but it also required a degree of realism. Okay, you say, well, just now we are not able to do very much um, and we shouldn't expect to do very much. It's a bit like the situation that RS21 finds itself in now. But um, we have, I won't say history on our side, but we, if we hold to these ideas, we will be able to draw people around us. Um, we don't know how and we don't know where we'll be able to do it, but they're good ideas and we should, there's no other ideas we could possibly go around arguing, so let's keep on and we'll, we'll find some other people. Um, and for a period it worked. It, later on, it got various slightly daft notions attached to it, like the idea that you need a, a Leninist party with a, a permanent leadership of less and less talent to run it and so on. But that's, a, that's another issue. OK. <laughs> Sorry, I might as well get that in. <laughs> yes, you're speaking to the right people here. Um, so if... We're going to talk about um, sort of developing the IS tradition in our day and age. Right. What are the areas do you think that we should concentrate on? Oh. What are our state cap and permanent arms economy questions for our times? I wish I had a clearer answer to that question. One of the things we have to do is restate the Marxist theory of the state. Um, and take it, take it back from... There seems to be a revival of left reformism in the shape of attention to the, the late Nikos Poulantzis and so on. Um, I think we have to recover the revolutionary heart of the Marxist theory of the state but it's about destroying the state and establishing the most widespread popular democracy. Um, that's one thing. 
I feel there's very, very few people arguing that at the moment. Um, that's one thing. I think that the whole argument of, in shorthand, the social reproduction feminists <coughs> attached to an underdeveloped argument which comes out of Michael Leibowitz's book, Beyond Capital, um, is very important in that it, it's, it expands the notion of what the class struggle is about. There's been a tendency for Marxists to think that the class struggle is something fought in factories um, and not in the field of housing or transport or the environment or, you know, 101 other things to do with so the, the social, re the everyday process of the social reproduction of the working class. Um, so I think the work was, I think there's some very interesting work being done there. And I'm not sure that I've mastered it yet, but I, I have a sense that it's very, that's very, very significant. I think uh, there's a third area where I'm, I'm a sort of aware that it matters, but I'm not sure that I have anything to say about it, which is the whole field of the study of international relations. It's attached to the question of the theory of the state, but the sense that the state is always one state amongst many, and that capitalism internationally, the world market is match, matched by and um, held together by a, a system of competing states is not some, it, we, we've a lot of work to do still in that. It's, it's sometimes called the theory of imperialism, but um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of work needs doing there. There's been some very interesting work coming out. And, I mean, there's a new generation of young Marxist scholars who I think are doing some really interesting work in that area. Um, I'm, I haven't kept up with it sufficiently, and I can't judge it, but I, that's another area. Um, a fourth area, which is connected with what I think was my second area, which was about, so, well, it, which I index by talking about social reproduction feminism, is the question of movements and what the class struggle actually means when you translate it into the concrete. Because the class struggle itself is um, an abstraction from many particulars. It's one of the mistakes of people who think that the class struggle is something that happens in factories, is that they also have a narrow conception of uh, what a movement is like. Um, and the classes don't fight the, the at one level, the, the, you can say the class struggle is the motor force of history, but when you translate that into concrete terms, then the, the bodies that fight the class struggle from below are not called classes, they're called movements. Um, and we need more thinking about that. And uh, that's what I've been, has been preoccupying me for the last few years. And I'm not sure that I'm expressing it very well, even having worked on it over and over again, I'm still not sure that I've got it right. But there is something in that area that needs a lot more development. Um, movements will, it will be a movement that will bring down capitalism, if anything does, and that movement will not be a movement of the single class <clears throat> There's that lovely remark by Lenin at the time of the um, 1916 Dublin Uprising, when he said, you know, people think that a revolution consists of people lining up on either side and saying, on one side everybody says, we're for imperialism, the other side says, we're against imperialism, and it would now be nice and simple, and actually it never is, and there'd be all sorts of elements entering into the making of a revolution, petty bourgeois elements, idealistic elements, religious elements, God knows what, what elements, and they'll be part of the real story. And it will not be a simple lining up of classes with each with their program and their leadership. Um, it'll be much more interesting.